Hi, Faisal. Welcome to The Connected Generation. I'm really excited about our conversation. Thank you very much for having me, Nikkei. Um, I know it's evening for you, so thank you for, for making the time away from your kids to, to be here today. No, 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 no worries at all. I'm excited to hear um, about your journey. Um, you founded Genetica, which is the first family health office globally. How did you get here? Tell us about Faisal's life journey. Well, it depends how far you want me to go back. <laughs> <laughs> depends on how far you want to tell us. <laughs> how long well, did we go? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, background, look, I'm born in the Congo, uh, just like you. I'm your neighbor, a um, mm -hmm. number of countries over. Uh, my father's born in the Congo as well. My mother's born in Tanzania, um, Indian origin. So mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, Gujarati at the core. Then I was raised in Belgium. Um, I finished my schooling in Canada. Uh, went wow. to university in the U.S., so went to UPenn, then graduated, worked in New York as an investment banker. Wow. And basically our generation, well, my brother, my cousin and I, um, my dad was experiencing a hostile takeover from his cousins and uh, when I was 18. So wow. he asked us whether we would want to return to the Congo. And we made it very clear that we'd love to raise our children in the first world or quasi first world. Mm. And so please don't count on us to come back. So he made his decision accordingly. So for us, we were looking for opportunities, you know, new frontier, quote unquote. I know it's a little more rare to talk like that today. Mm. Mm. And so when the Berlin Wall fell, we saw Eastern Europe as an opportunity. And in 1991, we entered Hungary. Um, which wow. uh, was Eastern Europe at the time. Today, it's Central Europe. And we started our own brand of clothing. So we entered in 1991, 92. I moved to Hong Kong to run the buying office and uh -huh. at the same time decided to trade equator and down. So you have the African equator, right? And uh -huh. all the countries below, we started to trade in. And so in Eastern Europe, we started as our own brand of clothing, became the largest non-food suppliers to all the hypermarkets, et cetera. And eventually then became the largest licensee to Disney, Warner Brothers, Cartoon Network in the region. So Hungary, Czech, wow. Poland, Romania, that whole region. So that was a 20 year run. And so that was one core business. Um, on the other side, the Africa side, mm -hmm. you look a little dazzling. No, I have so <laughs> many questions. I'm not puzzled at all. I'm just like, I'm taking notes and I'm like, I have like a billion questions. My brain is like, what am I doing with this information? Please keep going. Okay. Please keep going. So, wow. so I moved in 92, never been to Hong Kong in my life. So it was pretty crazy. I was 23. Wow. Um, I know it sounds a little, I don't know, whatever. It's like, it's like going backpacking, but this is different. This is not backpacking. This is running a company. Yeah. So my father, so he gave us a loan of 200,000 to start Eastern Europe. Uh -huh. And he gave a loan of 150000 to start Hong Kong. So I had $100,000 stop loss out of the 150, yeah. And then obviously I had to pack my bags and go back to university because obviously Warden didn't teach me properly the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I wrote my GMATs before I moved to Hong Kong. <laughs> Did very well, by the way. Um, so I was ready to go back to another Ivy League to <laughs> get things right. But uh, lucky for me, I was minus 70 and then first year broke even, second year made, you know, six figures. And after that, the rest was history. But wow. curveballs were in mm. store in mm. the Asian financial crisis. Wow. Um, you know, we basically lost all our retail earnings across the board. Wow. We had also in Eastern Europe decided to go into Georgia. So imagine Georgia, Tbilisi in 1995. Wow. <laughs> And we exited in 98. Uh, we found out some things about our partner that we were not aware of. Uh, mm. I won't go into details. Uh, we actually walked away, which was, you know, quite interesting um, after three years. But it was the greatest thing because it brought us back to focus in Hungary and the region. And then we just knock on wood, just crushed it. So coming back to Asia, yeah. So the Asian financial crisis wiped us out. And you were 20, sorry, you said you moved to Hong no, Kong we were, at 23. When... Yeah, yeah. So when the crisis happened, I was 92, six years later. So I was 29. Wow. I just got married. 
Okay, so imagine I get married six months later, my finances are wiped out. Obviously, she wow. has no clue. Physically, I end up with a slip disc. So this is just to give you <sighs> some points of connection. You know, support yeah. system is normally your your finances and your loved ones, right? Yeah. So that was the first warning that I got, which was in December 1998 of, you know, the body responding to, you know, to what I eventually built many years later. Mm. And so 99 was a year of reflection. And then 2000, we decided to enter Africa, but on the condition that we would not move there. Mm. So we went into, you know, we were trading, right? Sub-Sahara. So we either then bought out some of our clients mm. at 50-50, or we built from scratch. So we bought into the Congo, we bought into Mozambique, we built Angola from scratch, we built Mozambique from scratch, we built Sudan from scratch, et cetera, et cetera. So there we had four divisions, fast moving consumer goods, white goods, generic pharma and anti-HIV drugs, and general commodities. Mm -hmm. So that was from 2000 until September 2004, mm. where, you know, we had we were in 15 countries, running business in hundreds of millions, 10,000 employees. I, walked, I was walking out of the doctor's office and he said, whatever God you believe in, please pray. Hmm. And then things changed very quickly. So I'll pause there. I don't know what you want to ask me or if yeah, you want to I have continue. so many questions, Faisal. <laughs> I have... <laughs> Your life was um, very global. And very much, and I want to, I want to take a step back and really learn more about yeah. like your dad and your parents and uh, like the values in which they instilled in you and um, your exposure to the, the business, so to speak, your entrepreneurial learnings, your early days. I want to learn more <laughs> about that because this is just like, I'm like, you said you were born in the Congo, you were raised in Belgium, went to uni in Canada. I had to take notes. Uni in Canada, <laughs> worked in New York. <laughs> By 23, yeah. you're like in Eastern Europe. I'm like, sorry, in, no, you started trading Kong, in Eastern, Eastern Europe, Europe and then 22. Yeah. yeah, Hong Kong at 23. Like, that's a lot of like moving. Where yeah, did that I mean, look, boldness I, come from? Well, look, I mean, A, of course, my father, you know, he started from nothing. So he mm. started to work for his uncle. So he's next gen at mm -hmm. the age of 18, became a partner at, 30. Um, he, you know, they, you know, he always learned from, you know, he had a lot of Jewish friends. So he learned from them, you know, mm. to all the banking in Switzerland and the, and the nice watches and the cars and the clothing. And, you know, it was funny because the first, I remember going for the first time and, you know, I saw the bank account, it was discount bank of Israel, you know, and we're Muslim, right? And I'm like, yeah. what is this? <laughs> and he's like, be quiet. <laughs> you know, I was yeah. like, okay. <laughs> he said, they're the ones who taught us, you know, the old Marc Piguet and the Vacheron and the Patek Philippe and all the fun brands. And they taught us how to bank. So mm. we were actually part of a family, multifamily office. I remember since I was a little kid, since the early seventies. Wow. So in, in Geneva, which is quite funny, right? When you think about it today, because today mm. it's like, you know, all sexy. And it's like, wait a minute, these guys already figured it out in the seventies and we're waking up now thinking it's so such know, a new novel a la mode, a la mode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this We're stuff has been going behind. on <laughs> yeah <laughs> 50 years but it was it was a it was a pure money it was like an external asset manager to be honest it was not but i mean look don't know they I, they did make other arrangements but not to the level where today the family offices are operating mm. at least some of them I know today still most of them are external asset managers. Mm -hmm. So look, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, you know, we, at the age of three, I mean, I spoke French before I mm -hmm. spoke English. I went to a Belgian kindergarten. And then I went to the first year when I went to school, to international school, I didn't speak any English. So I had ESL for a number of years. Um, I didn't take French till grade seven because I spoke fluent French. Um, you know, we my parents taught us Urdu instead of Gujarati, which I think is a mistake, but anyway, it is what it is. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the moving around, the languages, uh, my father being a, you know, hardcore entrepreneur, um, you know, the head office was in Belgium, just like in our generation, the head office was Hong Kong in those days, because of the Belgian Congo, right? So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
yeah, he traveled six months of the year. So that was tough for, for us, obviously, as you can imagine. But yeah, my first entrepreneurial venture was selling, buying candy from the, from the petrol station at the age of, I think, 10. Wow. Um, and selling them in school. Mm. So that was my first uh, venture. But as kids, uh, once we moved to the Congo in the summer, we had a company called Société Samedi Soir which means Saturday night company. So we, mm. would, we would get agencies, obviously through you know, my dad and my dad's contacts, friends of ours, and we will sell the product. And it was, it was in the beginning, we would go into the market at 5 a.m. and sell to the mamas. You know, the mamas, as you know, like mm-hmm. in Nigeria, they control mm-hmm. the market. So mm-hmm. they used to laugh that they have these three you know, brown guys, right? Mundele, which is foreigner, right? Coming at five in the morning in this station wagon, you know, and selling product, on, you know, from the back of the station wagon. And then we got a little more sophisticated. Then we started to deliver straight into the market, but then collection became a nightmare, right? The mamas mm-hmm. paid cash and these guys, you know, was credit. Uh, but before that, look, I worked in the money room, right? Which is pretty smelly, to be honest. You know, the money's been everywhere. I think, you know, from Nigeria. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I know it's kind of rude to say, but you kind of, you almost want to vomit in there. So there's a room, all they did was count money. This is the days before the machines, right? And the machines, anyway, they would rip. Um, eventually, they just weighed the money and sent it to the banks, right? So it was kind of, you know, things evolved. Um, and so I worked there, worked in the warehouse. My dad used to be the importer of secondhand clothing. So imagine already in the 80s, he was importing 30 containers a month of secondhand clothing. Wow. Yeah, mostly from the U.S. So he used to go to Philly. So imagine he didn't speak any English and he learned English because he had to deal with the Americans. So he spoke French, he spoke Swahili, he spoke Lingala, you know, and then English he learned because of business. And um, so, yeah, he used to go to Philadelphia, he'd go to Texas, he'd go to California, he'd go to New York to, to, to negotiate with the shipping lines. Um, yeah, I mean, they were players, like they Mm -hmm. were, they played, they played ball, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and, um, so yes, I worked in the warehouse carrying hundred pound bales, you know, for those who who know how to do math, that's 45 kilos per bale. Like you're, you're stacking these like 30, 40, 50 up. So it was the same size, but yeah. So, you know, we, we worked, we worked. You worked. uh, Yeah. Yeah. We didn't. You had a full, like. M- the real life MBA by the time you were in your 20s. Yes. And that's, that's why. So when I was in New York and I was working for a French um, bank, so mm. we're doing cross-border M&A, France, USA. Like I said, I speak fluent French. I know French accounting. And then they started to hire these American MBAs, right? These guys from Colombia and whatever. And I'm like, these guys don't know anything about mm. business. They mm. don't understand the meaning of cash flow. Do they even know what it means that you run out of cash flow and you can't pay your employees? They don't mm. even understand that. And it didn't matter. And so I quit was when I realized, well, one, I was able to be asked to do a valuation, give two, three options. Um, I assume, you know, you know, they always want two, three ways to prove it. And mm-hmm. then they would just take my file and, you know, negotiate. Then I said, okay, I'm done because I wasn't going to wait 10 years to be MD. I just wasn't interested. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, it's very different. Yeah. People Mm. sitting, you know, unfortunately in some of these positions, buying companies, selling companies really Mm. don't know what it means to run a company. Mm. Right. Mm. So, but Hey, they make money, they do their thing. And that's the choice they make. Right. Mm. The world exists the way it does. We can't push against it right it just is yeah so we had a very um very interesting upbringing that was you know you know i chose to go like canada was boarding school i chose to go to canada mm-hmm. for boarding school which was an interesting experience as well um i thought my chances to go into the ivy league was higher if i was in canada okay. and um then in the congo which i don't know if it's true but that's the choice i made at the time and um yeah it was so there you are (laughs) fascinating fascinating and so yeah i wanna you spoke about how when you were in asia um you had the financial crisis and shortly around that time is when you you got married and you also had a health crisis you were kind of alluding to 
the support of two things are critical um, for one's well-being, um, like um, relationships as well as financial security. Can you unpack that a little bit more? I was just referring to the spine. So your spine is your support system, mm -hmm. right? So, so at that time, the financial support disintegrated, right? But it was the, the companies were okay. It's just there was no retail earnings. But it was eight years of retail earnings, which is serious money, right? Mm -hmm. And um, but I had just gotten married six months ago, right? So, and then so everything everything disintegrated, and six months later, I had a slip disc, and I can go forward if you want. So when when I was unaware, so um, you know we were. I was asked, I'm going to go into detail, which I've never done, but maybe today is okay. Um, mm. I was asked, we, we were supposed to go for separation documents. And when the lawyers met my former wife, they said, Faisal, she's gone, go for divorce. And I wasn't really ready. And I mm. accepted it. And so when they gave her a separate lawyer and I wasn't aware, I was taking a shower and I put my arm up and my back snapped. And what had actually happened was she had actually just entered into the lawyer's office to execute the divorce. And so the energetic, the energetics of that, I actually ripped, ruptured my disc and all I did was put my arm up to move the Whoa. shower head. So I'm just giving you, you know, the, the, the energetics of a body. So a body mm -hmm. will respond to an emotional, mental, relational um, impact and mm. each body part represents a different space. So when we are dealing, when, when a family is, is going through a challenging time, mm. we are looking for the body part that's taking the whack. So many a times the basics are gut for the stress, which then impacts sleep. Mm. That's very basic. Mm. Okay. But there's others. Like we had somebody who, just, you know, she's like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And I kept pushing and she was very upset with me. This is a matriarch. And at the end, she was just borderline, you know, um, her, her, her liver was almost history and she doesn't drink. She doesn't like nothing. She's completely clean, but she had fatty liver at a level where the docs were shocked and mm. it was all due to stress. Wow. Because I was looking for the body part that was taking the whack. So I know it's a bit strange the way I'm speaking, but the reality is, is that your, your human health for us is, is we look at it in multidimensional where we look at the physical component, mm -hmm. the mental, emotional component, and the relational component. And they're all interrelated and they're all interdependent and they impact each other. Mm. So... Mm -hmm. And, and that's the relationship we're looking at. So we look at a human completely. And so when something is happening, we look at, okay, how is that impacting the whole human system, which is a complex system, but a very intelligent system that protects mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. So these responses are protective. They're not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so I'm, I know we're going a little faster than maybe. Yeah, no, we're going to get into this. Like, this is really good. You were talking about how in September 2004, you had a health crisis. Can you share more so about basically, that? And I'm guessing it's from that experience, you then had this kind of insight into how this holistic wellness. Yeah. So basically, I mean, that, that day, obviously, as soon, you know, when a doctor talks about God, you know, tomorrow's going to be a rough day. Right. So I, you know, went home, obviously called and had everybody stop traveling. Um, specifically my brother and my cousin. And uh, the next day I did a PET CT in the morning and in the afternoon, he said, I'm very sorry, you have stage three cancer. And wow. this was 2004. So in 2004, that was felt like a death sentence. And at 35, that was the last thing they were looking. They were looking for tropical disease. Mm. And um, they were shocked when they saw. And it was, and of course, you know, I always joke and I say big ego, big cancer. Um, the issue was that I didn't have one tumor. I had 10 tumors what? and it wasn't wow. even the fact that there were 10, the two were very, very large. So one was the size of a Rubik's cube. So 10 by 11 by 11 centimeters in the back, in the back of my chest. And then I had wow. a tennis ball in my neck, which is five by eight by eight centimeters. And then I had eight on my lungs that were 
one or two CM. So yeah, so the next day I was admitted to hospital, they did a biopsy, but the key was that, you know, when I asked what happened, they mm. couldn't answer me. And that was perplexing, right? That you have the founder of the cure advising me, okay, he was based mm. in Indianapolis. He happened to be my doc, my oncologist classmate. So he founded the cure, but mm. he couldn't explain why I got it. And that's where, you know, the entrepreneurial or the African, you know, we always joke, right? The, the, the African, you know, or the Gujarati, whatever it is, you know, said, wait a minute, this is nonsense. So you're telling me that I'm most probably going to drop dead at 35, you know, how to supposedly cure me, but you don't know why I got no this. Why. And so that's where the inquiry began. And the inquiry began looking at how could I have contributed to an ecosystem within myself mm. to have created a fertile soil for the cancer cells to explode because we all have mm. cancer cells, but yours are dormant and they're behaving themselves, quote unquote, right? Mine went, you know, mine went for a serious party, mm. right? They just went AWOL. So why did they go AWOL in my body and they're not in many other bodies, right? And then I started to look at the physical components, the mental, emotional components, and the relational components. And from that, I started to realize that, wait a minute, this is not just about eating and, and, and exercise. exercise. There's a lot more going on that we need to take into account when we look at, you know, the overall human health, which includes well-being. Mm. And so that's how it all started to, you know, express itself or evolve or develop. Mm. Um, Remember, I was in and out of hospital for 11 months, so I had time. Wow. I had no energy, but I had time. <laughs> wow. Wow. And so... 20 rounds, yeah, 20 rounds of chemo, three surgeries. Yeah, it was, it was a rough, uh, rough ride. And so that inquiry led you to conclude that it was as a result of physical, mental, emotional, relational um, factors. So yes. health is beyond exercising drinking alcohol eating greens and <laughs> what the doctors usually tell us it's it's more yeah. um and wider and compassing than than what they say yeah. and so um is this then when you then led to established Connecticut? yeah so it, it first started for family and it was first interestingly focused i was supporting other family members i remember we're a big family gujarati the, you know we don't operate in fives and tens it's in hundreds <laughs> who were actually starting who were getting cancer mm. and then from cancer went to cardio to orthopedic to anything right so i started kind of supporting family members to begin and it was first physical you know getting the you know the medical side and then starting to unpack what's really going on some were open and some were resistant mm. some were like no i'm not interested and mm -hmm. some were like, oh, okay, this, this makes kind of sense. Yeah, maybe I need to look at this in a much wider space. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, yeah, and then nine and a half, well, 10 years ago almost, we, you know, I, I had the idea while I was in Dubai because I moved. I had promised that if I survive, I would leave. So I moved to Dubai in 2007, mm -hmm. but I moved back to Hong Kong in 2010. So the idea of doing this beyond the family was already there in Dubai. Dubai didn't have the ecosystem at the time to be able to build it. So when I moved back to Hong Kong, I said, okay, now it's game time. And, um, but of course, as you can imagine, everybody laughed at me. I mean, mm. I'm talking literally laughed at me. I went to see every major CEO of every major bank, investment bank, um, you name, you name it. And they just looked at me like, are you crazy? Like, what are you mm. talking about? It sounds very woo woo. Um, yeah. They were like, you know, I said, you're going to have a chief health officer, chief energy officer, chief, you know, that's going to be in the C-suite, that's going to manage people in a very different dimension than HR at present. And they were mm. just like, dude, you're, I don't know what you've been smoking. <laughs> so. Wow. And so today, um, use of family enterprises really around like this holistic health and wealth. Um, what are typically the presenting symptoms, so to speak, when they come to you and what's like the process that 
you know you take them through all right so so basically we every every human being or family is in what we consider three you know a combination of three stages so all of us are in some state planning okay mm -hmm. so whether it's legacy whether it's we want harmony whether we want connectedness whether we you know whatever it is there's some planning going on mm -hmm. right then the second is we're all in some form or another in transition right mm. that either it's about empty nesting or i've just sold my company or i move from management to 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 board or i'm planning succession or i'm thinking of you know starting an entrepreneurship or i just got married i just became a parent you know mm. each of us something is going on in transition and then if we're honest there's something that's kind of chronic acute right that there's a little bit of a relational dynamic issue or mm -hmm. there's a bit of a health issue that's kind of lingering and i'm not really addressing or there's you know some something going on with my spouse or my kids or my cousins or you know whatever it is so mm -hmm. so what we look at is what you know we have this this chart which is on the website anyway it's very simple and mm -hmm. we look at kind of we show a family and say where do you see yourself so there's an individual then there's nuclear family and then there's multi-generational family and i say where do you see yourself where do you see the nuclear family and where do you see the multi-generational family and then they start to circle mm. and and so so they come for different reasons they come for different reasons and they come at different points um initially there was of course a lot of reactive right where mm. people were coming in because there was a lot of pain um, whether it was physical whether it was relational whether it was divorce i mean we're still dealing with all that don't don't get me wrong um now there's a lot more transition Mm -hmm. and planning but a lot of transition right because when when a mama if they happen to be you know whatever it is right is empty nesting you know it so happens to be at the same time as premenopause and as a result that whole process of of purpose and process of that physical space you know is is something that's very challenging mm -hmm. right when somebody sells their company you know, we get a lot of those. They've sold their company and they're like, what do I do next? Mm. Right. And many a times they come to us for what I do next. But there's also a lot of what they didn't do while they built the company and mm. created that needs to be supported. Right. Which i.e. are mostly relationships mm -hmm. or their physical health or their just state of being. Right. Mm. So so different reasons people are coming and. Um, but yeah, more and more, it's family dynamics, a lot of family dynamics, but also a lot of personal transformation, right? That mm. whole next stage, that whole mm -hmm. next step, or mm -hmm. taking the game on a leadership level to the next, to the next level, because mm -hmm. people are physically fit, they're doing really well, but they want, you know, what is called, quoted as mindful leadership or, or collective thinking or, you know, impact, mm. you know, so those, so they're coming in for those reasons too, where we're like, can you help us take the game to the next level? And again, we're looking at it as a whole human, right? Mm. We're not just looking at, and, and um, so, yeah, so we have an assessment process and then we have pathways and depending on if you already know what you're doing, sometimes you go straight into a pathway. And if you're just exploring, then yeah, you do a eight week to 12 week um, assessment, which in involves eight or 11 experts and, um, and then you get to have a few mirrors on blind spots that uh, you may or may not <laughs> want to have seen. <laughs> I uh, This is just completely fascinating to me because um, you spoke about how when you first had this idea, everyone laughed at you. And now look at how you've built up like this model and you've got a multidisciplinary team all over the world serving enterprising families. What do you see in the future with this integrative health and well-being and wealth in this space? How do you see this all playing out? Um, I, I think that you know our our push is to bring well-being into the family office system, right? Mm -hmm. um, whether you build it yourself or you have somebody externally do it with you, because at the end of the day, we call it a family office, a family enterprise, a family business. Mm -hmm. How much time, energy, and resource are we putting to the for the family? 
And that's what was the original drive to bring back the family first. Now, people don't like that because they say without the enterprise, the family would be compromised to a certain extent, which is fine. Mm. So let's at least make them equal or important, whatever that word is, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. just like when you have a family business or, or, or a family office, you do a lot of forward thinking planning and there's a lot of resource available. But when I'm going through life, I've just gotten married or I just became a parent or I'm just starting entrepreneurship or I'm having some, you know, some, some doubts of, of what's happening. Why not have this infrastructure ready where everything's a phone call away, mm. right? Mm. So that if I don't know what to do and I'm stressed, I just pick up the phone and, and the resources are available. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go figure it out myself because I could have had something that happened at home with my spouse and you could mm. have something that happens, but you're a go-getter, right? And you make some phone calls and you go, you get yourself somebody to talk to and you nip it and it's done. Mm. Me, I'm kind of like, you know what? It's going to be okay. It'll work itself out. I put it under the rug and I wait. And then it just, you know, and then all of a sudden, by the time I address it, it's very late, mm. right? So if the infrastructure existed, even though I have that personality, I, if I know it's a phone call away, I'm going to make the phone call, mm. right? Unless I really am in denial, which is, you know, which is a different topic. So, so the idea is that a, the dream is that it becomes a default availability to everyone. And this is not about me marketing genetic care. No, no. this is about yeah. humanity, yeah. right? The well-being of the family so that we all have peace of mind. We all know that, you know, we have support as we journey life. So our mm -hmm. objective is to, to help families have, have the agility and adaptability to truly be anti-fragile. Mm. as they move through the world because covid supposedly was a black spot swan but was it really mm. right mm. and how prepared were we because it's not just about resilience it's beyond that right mm. so right now the new word is resilience right but it's beyond that it's let's go to taleb's real meaning of anti-fragility and take the game to that level so the first is of course we are focused on you know as you know the family enterprise is the largest employer in the world is the yeah. largest contributor to GDP and has the most impact, you know, capacity wise in philanthropy and day to day to community and society. So mm -hmm. we are focused on this group because they are the largest influencers mm -hmm. and can have the largest impact on the world. So if you want to shift, if you want to go now to the next level, you want to shift consciousness of humanity, right. And really take the game to the next level. These are the leaders or the mm. future leaders of the world, mm. right? So our focus initially is that. And then we pray, and this is our next phase, is to bring this to the rest of the world, right? In an affordable manner mm -hmm. that it becomes the default for the mm -hmm. globe, just as a human, irrespective of your citizenship or, you know, where you live, whether you're from, you know, like me, the Congo or Canada, or I don't even know where I'm from, but anyways. Right? <laughs> Global citizen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that's mm. kind of, you know, what, what, so there's, there's different steps, you know, because mm. remember, as you know, succession is a major challenge. And I it think is. that's, that's really honestly, deep down, it's insulting, right? If you're mm. the largest employer, you're the largest contributor, you're the, large you're able to make more impact than anybody else but you haven't figured out succession i mean it's a cosmic joke i'm sorry to say um, and why do you think it's so difficult for folks to figure out is it this underlying relational emotional mental yeah. yes yes because you see unfortunately whether we like it or not right most of us are approaching the family dynamic piece very quickly in the collective, mm. right? We're going straight to the collective without really unpacking the, the, the individual, individual and the historical, so. right? In our case, if, we're, if somebody comes in and wants to focus on family dynamics, there's an eight month process minimum. Hmm. And I'm talking weekly, okay? Weekly uh, with an expert. So it's only one session a week. It's not like we're talking about 10 hours, just one hour a week. But for eight months with probably eight experts 
to mm. do your personal work. So the first four months is really foundational. So you're really looking at beliefs, patterns. Um, you're looking at drivers of behavior. You're looking at if there is, which there always is, right? Trauma, things like that. And then the second is you start to build out and really, you know, transform. And then the third is the integration, which mm. is the last four months where we start to bring the family in. And even mm. then, it's not the family all at one time. It's kind of combinations and permutations of, of, of stuff that needs to be cleared. Mm. And then we present it to somebody like yourself or to an advisor and say, you know, we're, we're the sous chef. I always joke with the advisor. I go, we're the, we're the ones you choose you know, what you want to cook, which is the family, right? We cut it up. We cut it up. We cut the vegetables, the spices and everything. We keep it ready and you just cook, which is the constitution, the governance, the shareholder agreement, right? But let us do the prep work. And the better the prep work, the more sustainable whatever you're creating, right? Which is, you know, the, the document of how we do things and what we represent and who we are. Mm. So mm. that's kind of, you know, what, what I feel is the missing piece, right? That we are not spending enough time and energy and resource on the individual and the family, right? But the individual particularly, and we're going straight to the collective. Yes. So there's all this stuff that you show up with that, you know, I always joke with, you know, I've, I remember sitting with a family in London and I'm like, how would you like to take that 40, 40 foot container of stuff and, and, and make it into an essential backpack. And they looked at me like I was crazy. They said, is that possible? I said, yeah, if you're, ready to, if you're willing to do the work, we get rid of all the noise, right? Mm. Like when you write a book, you've written, you just finished writing your book, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm writing my second book, right? And, and when you start it, you just, there was all this stuff, yep. right? And then you had an editor help you to, to, to bring it to the, to the essence. And then now you brought it to the world. It's the same thing. I have all this stuff about my mom, my dad, my brother, my uncle, my cousin, my, my childhood. My, and a lot of it is misperceptions because mm. I gave the meaning when I was two, when I was three, when I was seven. When I look at it as an adult, it's like, hmm, wait a minute. Maybe I'm a little off. Maybe I didn't have all the data. Maybe that's not mm. what they meant. Maybe that's not what actually happened. Hmm. Right. And, and that's impacting the relationship, right? Mom, dad, brother, sister, uncle are doing their best with their level of consciousness at that time, including myself. Yes. Yeah. If, you know, when, when I was, you know, when I was married, um, you know, in the 19, whatever, late nineties, early 2000, of course, yeah. if you ask me today, there's many things I would have done differently. Right. But at that time I did my best. Mm. Right? Yes, some were good choices and some weren't. Okay. Whether it's as a spouse, as a parent, as a you know, as a partner, or as a leader. I, I would do it differently. But mm. hey, it's done, it's gone. Mm. Right? Mm. But I can either sit back and look at it and celebrate and also acknowledge and reframe so I don't do the same. Mm. Right? But my dad did his best, my mom did her best. My former spouse did her best. Everybody, all of us, hmm. right? So it's it's not about going and 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 you know unearthing for nothing. It's really a, to unearth so that it, you know, that doesn't impact my choices mm -hmm. going forward and the relationship and mm -hmm. my state of being. Sorry, mm -hmm. I went into a lot of detail. No worries. Sorry, I have one last question. Do you have time? Yeah. just for one last. Yeah, question. yeah, yeah. I'm here. I'm just wondering, a lot of yeah. people that are listening to this may be thinking and reacting that does it really require all of that individual work, and, <laughs> you know, and I was going to ask you to kind of articulate the benefits of doing this, like what's the return on investment, so to speak, in our usual business language, yeah. but I then thought, you know what, maybe that's not helpful. I'd like to understand <laughs> the psyche of the families that approach you and mm -hmm. are willing and prepared and committed to do this work, why are they? What do they see in this and the value that they derive from this? Look, some, some have realized that what they're doing isn't working. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, you know, I, I, I made a trip. I, I just came back from a very long trip. And what I'm hearing from a lot of the people doing governance documents 
that post during COVID and post COVID, a third of what they've, what they've prepared is not working. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of numbers mm -hmm. and that's a lot of acknowledgement. So some are coming because it's not working, right? Others are just, you know, realizing that they don't want to take the risk, right? Of having an eventual issue, right? Mm -hmm. They're acknowledging that we're putting stuff under the rug. They're acknowledging that this siloed, siloed way of doing things, right? Is not working, right? It's like, it's like saying, I go to the medical system and I just have, I just look at one slice mm. of, of my body and I don't look at the rest and there's nobody to integrate it, right? A human is complex, right? Even from a medical perspective, even a business like, oh, I'm only going to focus on cash flow. I'm not going to look at sales. I'm not going to look at margins. I'm not going to look at, you know, all the different pieces of a business, right? I'm just going to look at one piece. You can't run a business like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And also when you ask one person to do the work, right? So imagine you're the CEO and you're asked to do the job of the CFO, the COO, the CIO, and the CTO, mm -hmm. but you're going to do all of it. And that's, what's the approach we have to families. We have one person trying to be all. Yeah. Right. They're what we call may most many times effective, but they're not efficient. Because mm -hmm. if you ask me to do the operations, yeah, I can do it because I built it. But am I efficient? No chance. Yeah, I can do the finance because I can read, you know, P&Ls and balance sheets while I'm asleep. But does that mean I can sit and do one from scratch at the pace that my team can? No chance. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's, 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 so they're coming, A, when it's not working. But many now, like I said, are coming because they realize and they acknowledge that we need to go much deeper. Mm -hmm. Right. And we need to go a lot, um, how to say, not just deeper, but also wider. Right. Mm -hmm. As we approach it. And and look, to be honest, a lot of it is coming through referral. Mm -hmm. Right. The majority of the work is coming through reference. Right. Whether it's another family, whether it's an advisor, um, you know, because the advisors realize themselves that this mm -hmm. is the missing piece. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't realize. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, it's, they cannot force someone to do it. They can just suggest and say, look, it might be a good idea to kind of spend a little time as we go through this governance or constitution process to do a little work, mm. right? Individually and as a family, so that it's truly reflective of what you want going forward, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of legacy and, and, and some are open and some are not. So, you know, the advisor can only do what they can do. Right. And um, and so so, yeah, it's 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 but but you're right. It's it's not a you know, it's, I guess maybe it's not for everyone. I don't mm, know. Mm, right. Mm. Where, you know, it's they, they 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 don't want to look under the hood. A lot of people are not ready for that. <laughs> it's scary. Yeah. But and I also, I think you, it requires a mind shift, a mindset shift. Look, I tell you, Nikkei, this is the thing, right? People ask me, Faisal, so when am I ready? I said, you're ready when you're ready to invest 60 minutes a week. And they're like, what? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, 60 minutes yeah. a week. They're like, oh, anybody can invest 60 minutes a week. I said, yes. And I said, just know that, you know, our core team is 25 experts. Okay. And you'll be working with about 12 of them in the year. And remember, they are specialists in those specific things that are there. And they're very gentle. They're very loving. They're very kind. Remember, our brand has care in it. Love mm. and care is our number one value, mm. right? And they're very effective. So it's not that you need to go and spend, you know, like they're unfortunately doing, hours and hours and months and months trying to unpack one item. Most of the time, it can be unpacked in 60 minutes. That's mm. how efficient the process is. Mm -hmm. So it's about testing, right? Showing up and seeing how quick and fast it can be, mm. right? So it's not, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a business guy, right? I happen to be in this space because life, I don't know, dragged me, presented me, whatever the word is, right? Mm. I'm, not a, I'm not from that world. I'm from the other world, like you, right? I'm from the family enterprise world, but now I'm on this side. So I understand both sides. And mm. so a lot of 
people are effective, but they're not efficient because mm -hmm. they're not working in integration with this many modalities, mm -hmm. right? So for us, it was, how do we make this process easier? Because I don't want people to go through pain, right? Mm -hmm. So pain is inevitable. Suffering is a choice, right? So we want to make it. That is good. Sorry. Keep going. Yeah. So, so it's how do we help you, right? Process the pain that I know is not a choice, right? But mm -hmm. keep the suffering to the minimum. Because suffering is when you resist what is. Whoa. Right? So, Whoa. So, yeah. so it's really, you know, um, I mean, look, I, I have a gentleman that, that um, you know, we're, we're onboarding. And he just, it was very simple. He said, I just want to be accepted for me. Mm. And this is a patriarch of a very successful company. It's like, I just want to be me. Mm. That's it. Mm. I asked him, what is your, give me three objectives. He just gave me one. He said, Faisal, I just want to be accepted as me. Don't, mm. don't try to change me, mm. please. Right. And that's all he said. Mm. Right. And he's ready to do the process with his spouse and his kids. Okay. And that's all he wants. Mm. It sounds so simple, right? Mm. Powerful, powerful. Um, pain right? is inevitable. I mean, Suffering is a choice. Suffering is when you resist what is. Wow. Right. So, I mean, don't, Nikkei, we all want to be heard. We all want to be seen. We all want to be acknowledged. We all want to be celebrated. Mm. Right. And that's for everyone. Mm. And imagine you're a patriarch. You've built this incredible enterprise. You've done so well. You provided everything for your family. And at the end, all you're saying is just, I just want to be me. Please, just let me be me. How much more basic can it get? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So imagine somebody comes to you and says that. How are you going to unpack that Yeah. as please. an advisor on your own? It's right? heavy. It's very heavy. You understand? Mm. And, and it's about everybody knowing what the objectives are. You have, you have a collective objective. The collective objective was we want to spend more time as a family, right, in harmonious and joyful conversation mm. versus resistance and, you know, con conflictive. That was their objective as a family. So what does that mean? We all need to show up in a state of being that's not what is because mm. we're showing up with stuff. We're getting triggered. We're projecting. Mm. Mm. Right. But if I come in in a calm center space and I do my work and I only bring up the essentials and I actually speak where I meet you, where you are, because I understand where you're coming from, mm. because now I've understood, Oh, there's all these different ways of, of sharing and speaking and, 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 and being able to relate. Okay. Oh, I understand now. Mm. Right. Because there's a world beyond me, mm. right? Everybody's not me, right? I've had my experience in, in Congo and Angola and these places. You've had yours in Nigeria and the other countries, mm. right? You know, when I say, when I tell people I feel safer in Angola than I do in some of the major cities in Europe, they're like, what? <laughs> I said, yes, because I understand the system and it's predictable mm. Mm. here. It's not. Not Hong Kong. I'm talking about some of those cities and they mm -hmm. think I'm like completely out of my league, but you understand it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because you understand the meaning of a system mm -hmm. and predictability, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same, right? Coming back to this family, it's like they're asking simple things. You know, they're not asking for the world, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it's how does one as an advisor unpack that? What is joy? Mm. Mm. Joy to me and to you could be very different. Indeed. Indeed. Right? And so, so these are the things, right, that, that you know, and, and I, mean, I can go into one more example where, for example, when somebody comes in and they say, we want to plan for the next gen. I mean, you're the, you're the mm -hmm. next gen mm -hmm. specialist, right? And, and it's just funny. So I had a family come to me and, and uh, we work with them on values and a lot of other things that we were working with one of the brothers in depth. And, um, and they said, Oh, basically we want to, 
we want to prepare the next gen. And I said, please go to everybody else. Come to me last. <laughs> so I, they said, why? I said, because you love me and you hate me. So you know that's true. So they did all their you know, math and came back three months later. And they brought all these presentations. And I was like, wow, go for it. They said, no, but you haven't told us what you want to do. I said, it's completely had nothing to do with what they're talking about. So everybody had all the, you know, the plan of you got to do this and education and, you know, mm -hmm. with all due respect, okay, all of that is absolutely necessary, mm -hmm. okay, because without that, it's a, it's a disaster waiting to happen. So mm -hmm. every piece they proposed was on the money, right? The education on the family office side, on, on the money side, on the personal leadership, all of that was just on the money, right? But I said, but there's a bigger, there's a bigger item here. They said, okay, what is it? I said, if I'm the next gen, You've created a toxic tank. I don't want to go swim in it. Clean your tank and I'll come swimming. If you don't, I'm not coming. <laughs> and you can imagine the reaction, right, Nikke? Luckily, I was not. You are bold. <laughs> <laughs> you said the stuff a lot of us. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. understand? Yeah. Look, Nikke, let me be honest. I'm paid to say what nobody wants to say. Yeah. I'll be very honest. Okay, I sit with some of the, you know, I know you do too, right? Yeah. And I say what nobody wants to say. But you know what? I cannot sleep at night if I don't. Because there's a lot okay? of intergenerational trauma that is possible. Yeah, so I, yeah. Said, I said, you know, please. I said, this is my point of view. You don't have to listen, right? And the reality was, so we ended up spending a whole year, actually more than that, right, where where they worked on themselves and then they worked within each other. There was a lot of crying. There was a lot of celebration. There was a lot of acknowledgement. There was a lot of incredible transformation that happened. Mm. The business is thriving. Okay. The relationship now is understandable where let's say you and I are, are one of the siblings and you're one of these people that has ideas flowing without doing all the math necessarily. And I'm this conservative guy going, wait a minute, you know, I need to know. 50 things before I'm going to open my mouth. But now I understand. Nikkei is the ideation woman. Mm. I'm the boring execution guy. <laughs> right? Without Nikkei, we're not going to do amazing mm. things. Mm. But before, I would be like, oh, here goes Nikkei again. Here we go oh, again. Yeah. Oh, God. Nikkei losing her head. Oh, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> right? But now it's like, wait a minute. Wow, I value the fact that we have this difference between mm. us. Right. And then you start to value that. Yeah. Without structure, I can't have the spontaneity because mm -hmm. you're the spontaneous one. But I need mm -hmm. structure from the structure. I have the springboard and then I can make a splash. Mm. Right. So so a lot of acknowledgement, a lot of ability to communicate because a lot of things were not said. Mm. Right. You weren't respecting, let's say, travel or you weren't respecting, you know, a, 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 a number of things which we had agreed to. How do we have that conversation? Mm. I don't because I don't want to upset you and you're going to get upset. But now everything's getting unpacked, mm. right? Now you've done the work between the siblings. Now, unfortunately, mm. many are not trained like we were trained. We were trained not to come home and say anything. Mm -hmm. Like mm. literally say nothing. So we don't taint our spouses. But unfortunately, in most cases, that training is not existent. Yeah. <laughs> And they and taint they their spouses. The junk, yeah. Right? Now the spouses are tainted. And then the spouses and themselves taint the children. Yeah. So first you have to clean this. You have to do the work on the spouses and themselves, right? Male, female, doesn't matter. Then you have to work on the spouses. And then, and then you have to, you know? So, yes, it takes time. But you know what? It's a choice, Nikkei. It's a choice. You know, I'm not... Look, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a flavor for everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's be very clear. Right. My people are very loving. They're very kind. My experts are really not me. They don't talk as boom as I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, um, you know, they will call a spade a spade. Also, they're not, you know, but they're, you know, they're very gentle about it. Mm -hmm. You know, while I'm a little more, like you said, a little more bold. So, <laughs> so I'm just giving you one example as a very different approach to what most people would do in succession. And, and look, it's, it's created, you know, a very different atmosphere for the next gen because they saw 
the work being done. And the spouses are excited to do the work mm. because they saw the incredible relationship that the siblings have, have today that mm. they never had. Mm. And they also value now the other siblings, like I just explained with you and me. They start to see, they go, wait a minute, you know, together, one plus one plus one plus one is 1,111. Mm. Mm. Now that's a lot of power, mm. right? Mm. So now they start to see the bigger picture because they see the harmony that's happening, mm. Mm. right? And they start to see the value of the family enterprise, which means the family within the family enterprise. And I think when you ask me, what are you, I'm saying, you know, I, as you know, you know, uh, Philip and Iraj and Kenneth, if they mm -hmm. they've come up with the circular economy, right? The, the mm -hmm. whole space. And that's, that's what we're trying to bring is that the value and the perception of the family at this moment is very limited because of this family dynamic stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. If you look at today, the respect and the value they have for the enterprise, it's unbelievable. And it's mm. not because they're doing very well financially. Right? Mm. I just had a call last week and things are getting, again, bumpy. Okay. As you know, the world is getting bumpy. So now mm -hmm. they're, it's getting bumpy. Right. But they're, they're okay. They're ready. Mm. Mm. Right. Because they're able to communicate. Mm. The favorite word, right? Communication. What do you want to work on? Communication. Right. And the other word, what's the other one? Family dynamics, mm -hmm. which is code for we have a problem. Dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> we have stuff to, to work through. Yeah. Yeah. But for us, it's it's about love. How do we move towards love? How do we move towards care? How do we move towards gentility, respect, honor, celebration, acknowledgement? Right. How do we move towards that mm. individually and as a family? Right. And from there, everything's possible. Mm -hmm. Faisal, wow. Um, this has been incredible. I love the picture of cleaning up the toxic tank. I really love it. I think it really, it, for me, that's when I had the aha and I fully got it here and here, like the work that you're doing. Um, yeah, we, we can treat the surface presenting stuff. The, education the you know the um, governance the structures and whatnot but if we don't clean up our toxic tanks inside and with one another it, what is the succession we're talking about at the end of the day as you say it's about the family it's about the love it's about the harmony it's about the vitality um thank you this has been incredible i need to listen to this like a few times um but i just want to been... I, I just want to take one step back it's there are many families who are coming that want to take the game to the next level. So it's not about just the downside. Yeah. There's also the upside. upside. They have a great, they have a good relationship. They have a lot of good stuff happening and they want to thrive. They want mm. to be in a state of joy even more than that already exists. So mm. there is still some, we all have cleaning to do. I'm doing cleaning yeah. every week, right? I have my experts, you know, beating me up every week in a loving way. Right. So I, I don't want to be known as the toxic tank cleaner mm. either. Right. <laughs> but we are, we are, we are doing that. Let's be honest. I'm not going to, to, mm. you know, say otherwise, because we all have cleaning to do, right. It's spring cleaning, of course. right. It's, of course. it's every year we do spring cleaning. Right. And I think that's, what's important too. Are we doing the spring cleaning or are our closets getting, you know, full of stuff that we don't need stuff that's yeah. no longer relevant stuff that's we need to let go mm. and it's the same thing from the from you know some of the mental imprints and the emotional imprints and and you know so i always say this we control two things in life the meaning we give and our response yeah. and each event has a physical mental emotional and relational imprint mm. right and that's what we're looking at when I say spring cleaning, do we need to let go of some of those imprints? Do we need to reframe those imprints? Mm. Because maybe it weren't contextualized, mm. right? We didn't really know the big, the full picture, right? And that's the spring cleaning I'm talking about. So, so Powerful. yeah. Powerful. And if anyone wants uh, to get hold of you, learn more about 
Chinetica, are you, how best can they reach you? So yeah, the best, I mean, obviously just go on the website. I mean, you have my details, you know, send us an email, pick up the phone and, um, you know, we're here, we're here to serve. And again, you know, where it's more, you know, like I said, our core values, you know, love and care. So it's, it's really, you know, we're, we're playing a very different rule set than, than most, but Hey, I'm alive, so why not, right, Nikkei? <laughs> mm, <laughs> Second powerful. lease on life. Uh, second yeah. lease on life. So better, better make it count, right, Nikkei? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> of course, and you are better making behave, it count. Right? This is this is sacred work. Um, thank, thank you, you for this contribution. It's it's amazing. It's amazing. Thank you. No, no. Thank you for having me, Nikkei. It's always been a pleasure. I yes. haven't gone into some of the details I went in today, so I hope uh, it wasn't too much. No. Uh, God. My, my team is going to be like, face home. Be <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you only live once, so why not? Thank so, you. no, no. Thank you. And uh, sorry to keep you up late. I know no it's worries. getting late for you there. No worries. And, uh, it was worth it. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you.